Thanks. Yeah, no, it's really good to be here. I've been really kind of had to drop off the planet to a large extent because um, I'm coming up on the last year of my doctorate on contemporary ghost literature, which is uh, proving to be very interesting. And there's been some talk now from different universities about publishing it. So I'm quite excited about that. But it is, if any of you have done a doctorate the last year, it's all great. It's all fun and games for the first two years, just lots of reading and hanging about, swanning about the place. But the last year is really kind of brutal. So that's where I'm at now. So for the next few months, I'm sort of making myself scarce. But um, yeah, no, I'm delighted that Wendy asked me to come and talk about this course. This is a really, let me just screen share for a moment. I don't know if I can. So um, this is a course that I decided to design actually specifically for this sort of gap I saw um, you know, there's lots and lots of people teaching mediumship. There's loads of places you can go if you want to train to be a medium, if you want to be able to mediate those conversations with, um, you know, other loved ones and whatnot. But what I found was that for people who are not, don't want to do that, who just want to be able to maintain a relationship with their own loved ones, um, there really wasn't anything available for them because it's quite a different type of training to the training for mediumship. Um, and so what I found was, um, and as you know, Wendy, you've read my book, how you read my book. Those of you who've read the book know that for me, after my partner died, I did go through a period of time where I was just being absolutely battered by lots of myths and superstitions. A lot of it was quite harmful. Um, and so I noticed that there, really, there was lots of people really struggling in this way. And so I designed this course to teach people who are not mediums, just to, because every, to my mind, everybody is capable of maintaining a relationship with their loved ones in the afterlife, as long as you can sort of have some understanding of the language of the spirit, of what that communication um, looks like and feels like. And for me, um, you know, it's different for everybody. So we can go to Amazon, get a book on, or you can go Google, oh, what are signs from the spirit world? But what I found is that really true, authentic signs um, are very personal. You know, they're very, um, I'll just stop this for the moment so I can see you all, because I can't see you in that, in that um, Windows sharing. Um, what I found was that, um, you know, people are going, well, I should be seeing a rainbow or pennies or I should be seeing a robin or I should be seeing a feather. And then they don't. And they think their loved ones are not communicating with them and whatnot. You know, what I, what I have found in my experience is that nobody knows your loved one better than you and vice versa. And the signs uh, and the, the way these people are making themselves feel present, your loved ones are making themselves feel present, is going to speak to you in, in, some, in a way you understand. So, for instance, if I saw a feather, for example, and actually there's a scene in my book where I won't, I won't give it away because it's sort of the end of the first part where people are saying, oh, you know, your partner might send you a butterfly. And I'm saying like that would not say him at all. Like it's the last sort of thing I would associate with him. Uh, and then I, want, I don't want to give away the story in case anyone hasn't re read the book and wants to. But what started happening the minute I said that, I said it to Professor Lou Legrand, the late Professor Lou Legrand, who wrote a beautiful book called Love Lives On, which I'm always recommending. Um, and so I sort of balked at this idea of a butterfly. And as soon as, no sooner as I said that, then I was inundated with them. I mean, they were crashing into me. They were landing on me. There were hundreds of them everywhere. But it, that was the sort of humor that my partner had. And so the, the number and the behavior of the butterflies at that point said him to me. But what I found is, is that, you know, like if I saw pennies, I wouldn't associate them with my mother or father or anybody else, but only with my granddad, because my granddad used to give me a penny every time I went to visit him when I was a kid, you know. And so what I, try, I designed this course to try to help people um, on two, in two ways. One was to understand uh, the nature of the spirit world. One was to, and to help people understand and recognize and how to work with those signs, how to ask for them, how to respond to them, and how to really look for very personal relationship. I mean, your relationship with your loved one is very unique and very personal. And your, your the loved one is going to be trying to send you signs and, you know, point to things 
in a way that is reflective of their personality and their relationship with you. So you don't really need to go to, you know, what I have found is people go, oh, I saw Robin, do you think that's my loved one? When it's your loved one and when you learn to see the signs, you don't have to ask that question because you just know. You know, you just know that's definitely, that, that has the mark of my loved one, that instant that just happened. And so what I wanted to do with this course was really help people work with those signs in that very personal, unique way that says to them very intuitively and with great resonance, that is most definitely the press of my loved one and they are present. This is not me trying to guess, was that penny or feather really from them, you know, the, the brings a, you can reach a point of that sort of sense of knowing, that sense of awareness of the presence, which um, really is something that can be developed once you start to really engage, discuss, talk to your loved one and start to build that relationship. I always find that I have, I've been through this myself, so I'm not in any way being facetious at all, but that we are so, we're so bereft that quite often we can fail to see, understandably, how exciting this new relationship can be in this sort of part physical, part non-physical relationship. It can be very, very exciting. There's all sorts of potentials in that relationship that couldn't exist in just a physical relationship. And so there is quite a lot of um, fun and excitement to be found and just sort of exploring new avenues of communication, new ways of being in these relationships. And so what I really wanted to do was to try to help people to find that in their grief and to be able to really start to cherish and enjoy their new relationship or their relationship with their loved one now in this form, rather than scouring Facebook and scouring Google, trying to find out, is this a sign of that? What's going on? You know? So there was a lot of real authenticity I really wanted to be able to bring to it and a lot, bring a lot of my own experience to bear, um, but also allowing people to take that and make it their own and to be able to use that to develop their own language, their own set of, I mean, you all, all of you have a spouse or a child or a parent, you have a unique way of, of that relationship is unique. I mean, even two siblings relate differently to the parents and that uniqueness can continue into the afterlife. And that's where you really can sense undeniable presence of your loved one. You know, it's most definitely them. The other thing I wanted to do with this course was to dispel myth and superstition because there is, you know, and now I'm doing a doctorate at the moment, as I mentioned. So I've been many, many years studying, you know, ghost literature, the cultural influences on ghost literature, where a lot of these theories originate. And what I have found is that an awful lot of what gets bandied about these days has originated with Homer, has originated with Dante, which are fiction, you know, has originated from, you know, theology of the Middle Ages. And it's sort of been taken on as gospel, so to speak. And it's just banded about as if it's a truism when a lot of this originated just from classical poetry, you know. And so what I wanted to be able to do was provide sources for a lot so that people can see where a lot of these myths, why these myths are myths, you know, and to dispel an awful lot of that and sort of get rid of, sort of dispel a lot of the sort of theological hangover that exists in this afterlife communication, because too often, you know, people think, um, or and that people are told all sorts of things that are not true, that rob them of this precious relationship that you can have in physical separation. So that was a lot of my motivation for doing that. And then, of course, what I wanted to be able to do was incorporate some of the techniques of mediumship into the teachings so that I could teach people how to attune, how to shift their energetic state to be able to be more receptive to their loved one. And so we work with different attunement practices, working with each other for attunement practices, which has been marvelous because when people start to work with each other, they start to see they innately have this ability. We all innately have a psychic sense. We all innately have the ability to be able to communicate. I'm not saying everybody can be, I'm not saying everybody can communicate with somebody else's loved one on demand or on command, but everybody has the ability to be able to develop a relationship with their own loved ones in physical separation. It's just a matter of learning the nuances of that relationship, 
of dispelling all of the myths that kind of bring fear and negativity and preconceptions and get in the way, create barriers, get rid of all of those. And then just help people start to develop that sort of sensitivity and that receptivity. It's just really learning a new language. It's learning the language of the spirit so that these relationships can continue. And I'm a huge advocate of these relationships continuing in a healthy way because it is possible for these, you know, there's too much judgment out there that says, oh, you're holding them back or, you know, you need to move on. And there's all of this stuff out there. But it is possible to maintain these relationships in a healthy way and it'd be incredibly productive and to make incredible contributions to the well-being of other people within these relationships. And it's just a matter of coming at it from a more positive way, from a healthier way, and from working through um, all of these uh, you know, preconceived notions, misconceptions and whatnot, to be able to get to a very healthy spiritual connection with your loved ones. So I'm a huge advocate of that because I've just seen so much harm done from people not trying to source, not having the experience, not questioning, not reflecting, you know. I mean, if anybody in this room uh, who has a spouse or child or parent or sibling or somebody that they're very close to, and some complete stranger came along and started telling, they're, you know, living at the moment, and started telling you how to talk to your child or your spouse or your mother or your sibling. I mean, you wouldn't pay any attention to them, would you? You're like, this is, I can talk to my own child or my own, father, my own sibling, my own nephew, you wouldn't pay any, any, any mind at all to them. You're like, why are you trying to tell me how to talk to my own spouse? So why are we listening to this when the spouse is in this corner from? Because we know people don't change and they change very slowly over time, you know? And so this is very important for me to be able to bring that and allow people to enrich their lives through these relationships so that's why it's very close, very important for me to develop, to develop this course. So I've taught it twice now. And I, I, when you take, I was taking very small numbers of people into the classes because when people are not trained as mediums, people need, you know, just need a lot of attention. So there were small classes, but they filled out, they filled up twice. And then I was getting more and more emails about it. And I don't really have a lot of time for teaching at the moment at my doctorate. So I basically put together... Um, the two courses that I did. And in the courses, um, there were periods every week for Q&As. So anybody had the opportunity to come and bring to the class questions that they had about what the practices they were learning, but also was an opportunity for people who, you know, had nowhere to go to get these answers. They were sort of going to Facebook. And I was like looking at some of these posts and it was like the blind leading the blind. And I thought, God, like they're just stressing people out you know like just that you know because we've got to understand the limits to our understanding of non-physical realities you know we are we can only it's i've always very very difficult to explain a non-physical reality for the simple reason that it's ineffable it's an experience it is beyond our normal frame of reference which makes it beyond language which means there are no words to describe it so it has to be experienced and that's what i'm really all about really sort of helping people have that direct experience so that you what's happening resonates intuitively you know you're not on facebook we're telling you that fe somebody telling you that feather wasn't a sign i mean i've seen all sorts of horrors on facebook and i thought god something has to be done about this something because because i know by my for myself and uh, the people who are grieving are in a very, very vulnerable place. And the last thing they need is somebody quoting something from the inferno without even realizing it's from the inferno, you know. And so there was a very, I just wanted to be able to bring knowledge, to be able to bring practices and to be able to bring understanding um, of the language of the spirit to people to help them out. So the course at the moment, what we did was um, took both the courses that I taught live, took all of the questions that everybody asked and put, the, and put it all into one on-demand masterclass. And I have a Facebook group so people can go, if they've got questions and want to interact with other people, they can go there because I think it's quite important to have a healthy environment of like-minded people, as you all know in this group. 
to be able to share your experiences with and ask questions with without somebody sort of throwing some theory from classic literature at you that's got no truth in it at all. And so, um, so we put together the masterclass for people to be able to study that, to go through all of the practices, to be able to find people to practice with, lots of recommended reading, you know. And so it's actually been quite successful. And it's very gratifying for me to be able to see people and hear from people who are recently bereaved, sort of suddenly realizing they can sit down and actually listen to something that makes a lot of sense. I can read books and find resources that actually just now make sense. And so it's been very, it's been very, very gratifying um, to do that. So I don't know, does anybody have any questions about that? Or well, what, what we do, so part of every week is where it's sort of discussion. Part of every week when I was teaching it live, and this, is, this was edited into the on-demand version, is sort of a discussion where people can come, you know, a lot of people who are coming to, who are recently briefed, are starting to notice something's going on and they don't know what it is or how to interpret it or how to understand it, you know? And so what I did for each week um, was allow people to bring in whatever questions that they had, you know, whatever was going on to be able to ask questions, whatever somebody told them, let's discuss, is that true or not? So for instance, there's lots of people and I, me included, hear these things of like, oh, you know, if you keep talking and trying to communicate with your loved one, you're going to hold them back. They won't be able to move on, you know, or your, your grief is, is holding them back or your grief is upsetting them or even worse things like, and I've heard this, you know, parents whose children died by suicide being told that their child uh, is lost, earthbound, wandering the earth, couldn't. I mean, I mean, I can't even understand the sense or even the, the intelligence or lack of it in saying something like that to a bereaved parent, you know, and it's completely untrue. I actually went up and looked up the etymology of the word earthbound, and it's a 16th century farming word. You know, so the thing is, is that people don't really go source where a lot of these things are coming from. It's just, it's just information being passed along and passed along and none of it is ac accurate. And so a very important part of this course each week was to address a lot of these um, misconceptions and to be able to really bring some reason into it. Like, let's just think about this. Not just me going, oh, all those people are wrong and I'm right. It's like, let's actually think about this and let's work it through. And then it became... You know what now? Yeah, when you think about it, when you actually think it through, it makes an awful lot of sense, you know. So like, how could somebody be earthbound? That's sort of saying that there's geography someplace, that there's this geography, there's that geography, and there's some no man's land in the middle. I mean, we even know from physics in the 21st century, we need to dispel this classical medieval thinking. We've come a long way in our understanding of consciousness. And we've come a long way in our understanding of physics to know that these things are not, cannot reasonably be true, you know? And so there's a very, that was a very, that's a very important part of each week. And then what we do is we work with uh, attunement practices, actually moving, bringing people and teaching um, people how to move into the altered states, how to change your vibration, how to change your energetic pattern, you know, how to very importantly surrender the ego and surrender, you know, the mind loves to get in and try to meddle and be helpful. And of course, never, it never is. And so I, I've, I've practiced Zen for 20 years. So on top of the spiritual training, spiritualist training I've had, bring a lot of Zen into the teaching because I find it absolutely invaluable in terms of being able to put the ego and the mind aside and actually be able to move into a pure place of spirit to be able to be on the same vibration and wavelength um, to be able to feel the presence of the loved one. So we do a lot of exercises in terms of a lot of practices in terms of that sort of sense of being able to move into a state of being receptive to the presence. You know, so I, I had a friend of mine there the other day was telling me over lunch that, you know, her husband died recently, but her little daughter can feel his hand on her face when she goes to sleep at night. And he used to go into her in the evenings, put his hand on her face and the, the child can still feel it. And this, you know, children are much more receptive to this. Um, and, but we can learn once we can learn to put away a lot of the baggage that we've picked up 
in our life, you know, as we get to this age, it is still possible for us to be able to do that. And so we'll bring a lot of Zen into it to be able to bring, allow people move into that state beyond ego, beyond mind, beyond reason, beyond skepticism, to be able to move into that place of reese, of surrender and oneness and receptivity, which we need to be in. So there's quite a lot of that sort of practice as well over the weeks. But also, you know, a very important part of that is also dispelling the myths because we have to dispel fear, you know, misconceptions, all of these things so that we can move into this place of receptivity without dragging any, without creating obstacles and boundaries, you know, for ourselves. And then we also, they do, the students do, is they actually do a little sort of uh, reading the incarnate. I always say, if you can learn to sense and read the incarnate spirit is the first step to being able to sense and related to the discarnate spirit. So people have gotten very excited about that because, you know, you go into a class where you're teaching psychic development, everybody expects to be able to get stuff. But what's great fun for me is when we move into a class where it's people who are just your regular people um, who have never done any of this before. And now all of a sudden, they're able to pick up all of this information about a partner in a breakout room. And it gives them such confidence to show that anybody can do that. Anybody who's willing to sit and do the practices, do the work, you know, be open-minded, open and dispense with myths, all of the mythology that's around this. I say mythology sounds like a really good word. I don't mean it in that way, but, you know, all the misconceptions, I should say. You can get very, very excited about all of this. And we move on then as the weeks go on to doing different practices. So one thing that as we move towards actually direct communication, I mean, it takes time to build the techniques, the practices, the presence to be able to get into that form of direct communication. And so what they do first is, uh, you know, everybody has to invite somebody who's not their primary communicator to come join with them. Because what happens is people are so eager, you know, to connect with their, with their that they're actually reaching out, sending out little tentacles to sort of, grab hold of their loved ones when really the basis rule of this work is to surrender and be receptive to receive but people get very very eager to sort of reconnect with their primary person so it takes a while so they have to go work with other people first um, because that means that they don't know you know it could be just somebody not your primary communicator come and blend with me so it could be it could be your school teacher, it could be granddad, could any, be anybody at all. And it's a great confidence builder as well, because it shows people that they were not expecting dear old gran, but he, they're really getting a real sense of they're seeing gran and realizing that it, they can communicate with anybody, any of their loved ones. You know? Can I just clarify f- from you, uh, Karen? You're talking about classes in every week. I, I had the feeling that this was on demand, that you could work at your own pace. So yeah, it, it's broken down into four weeks. So the original class was taught over four weeks. So the 50 lessons are broken down into the four weeks. Now, you could take eight weeks, 12 weeks, whatever amount of weeks you want to do all of those little lessons. But it was taught as a four-week class. Right. And, and you're not interacting with other students. You talk about being in breakout rooms. If you're doing this course... Are you interacting with other people? You can because we said I set up a Facebook group that's just for students called Spirit Ah. Space. And so when it comes to the places in the course where you have to find a practice partner, you can pop into Spirit Space and ask somebody in there to practice with you. So the students do that all the time in all the classes. You know, it's if it was an important part of all of the courses for me because I didn't want to sort of teach people all of these things and then have them go out and try to work with somebody who is still holding on to archaic beliefs. So it was important to be able to put them in with like-minded people and to be able to find other people who are also doing the course, doing the practices, doing the teachings, doing the readings, and to be able to practice with them. So everyone's speaking the same language, basically. So it was put there so that you can, you you do need to do the practices. So I did create the, the group so that people can go find people, practice partners. And how much time every week would people have to put into this course? It's really, you don't have to, I mean, you, it's, you, can, you have access to the course for a year. So you can do, you could do one lesson a week, one little five minute lesson a week, each week for a year. Um, 
so you, you can do it at your own pace. It's just broken down into four different segments, four different elements of focus. So it's really up to you. I mean, it's up to the student. Um, when, when I'm teaching it live, they always have two or three assignments a week. But if you're doing it on your own time, you just do it. You just pop into Spirit Space, find a practice partner when you're ready, you know, for that particular practice. So you've got a whole year. You can, you can spend a year completing the course. I recommend people try to do it in eight weeks at least just to keep the momentum you know and what's the success rate of the the p people that you have done the course how many of them have been able to establish communication all, with their partner yeah all of them in the live courses that i i can attest to i don't know about the masterclass because i have to you know they have to tell me how they're getting on but so far the response them up front to the masterclass on the facebook group has been very positive and i've got some very positive emails in the live class where i'm getting immediate feedback everybody communicated with a loved one fantastic now does anybody have any questions about the course rather than before we actually go on to talking about communication with loved ones your own experience Yes, hi. Um, I actually took the course that Karen's been talking about. I missed a couple sessions, but I took most of it. I would rate it an A+. Plus. It was wonderful. And uh, I did not have any grief at all, but I just wanted to take it. And I did have um, some connections. I was, I did, it did work for me. And uh, I did the breakup classes that she mentions that's on Facebook, where I practiced every week. So I, th I think it was really good, and I'd recommend it. Well, that's right, because you created your own room. So you had your own room on Facebook, people in the Facebook yes. group, people could go practice with you. That's right, yeah. Mm. Really, really excellent. The thing is, you really, I mean, that's a great way to approach it, because you really, you know, um, like I say, you can have a year to do the course, but if you could do it over eight weeks or 12 weeks and do all of these practices in between, it's better because you're building momentum. You've, you've got that momentum going. So I think it's good. You can do it, redo it. You can, you know what I mean? You can spend the whole year doing it if you want. But I would say that it would be better to do, you know, an hour or half an hour a day even if you could. I would say would be a great way to do it just to keep that momentum up. To be honest, a lot of it is really sitting and doing your daily attunement practice. You know, I always I ask people to sit in a meditation or attunement practice daily for about 20 minutes because that's just foundational to this work. That's what really alters the state for us, you know. So um, I, I do, even if you're only doing classes for 20 minutes, maybe twice a week, uh, to do actually try to sit for 15 minutes or 20 minutes a day in an altered state or in a meditative state, because uh, it's, very, it's very, very key to the development of the sensitivity to do the practice. You know. So I, when I was a child, um, I would, you know, much to my mother's dismay, would have little conversations with the dead relatives and wake up and see people, you know, standing at the end of the bed. And it would never bothered me at all, you to be honest. But... As I kind of got into 12, 13, into my teens, I had really zero interest in it, as most people don't. And, um, and so it just sort of went away. And I, have, I do have some memories in retrospect of definite communications, which at the time I just did, ignored. But um, when my partner, so uh, what is it, 13 years ago now, actually, 14 years ago now, um, I was in the South writing my first book when my partner in New York um, died of a sudden massive heart attack, only 42. And so um, I stayed in Virginia, which is where I was, I was down there doing some interviews in the South. Um, I was working on a book about the, the American South as part of the Northern Ireland peace process. Long story I won't go into. But, um, and so I stayed down, I was sort of house sitting this big old house in Virginia. Um, and I was there by myself in an attic. I mean, you couldn't make this, this is actually true. You couldn't make it, it was a converted attic, admittedly. But I was in the attic there in this big old scary house in Virginia. When all of these strange, about three or four days after, I was kind of in shock for the first few days, as, 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 we, as you, most of you can attest to, you know. And, um, but after three or four days, odd things started happening, like the lights started turning on, you know, I could feel somebody sitting on my bed, things were touching me. It was just endless sort of um, list of 
of bizarre. I was seeing those sort of two-dimensional black shapes that were kind of weird-looking things, and and um, and I actually thought, as most, I was a, I mean, I was a political journalist. I'd been a war correspondent. I wasn't long back from Iraq. Actually, I'd covered the war in Iraq, and so um, the first obvious uh, notion is that, uh, God, I must be out of my mind with grief. This, you know, but I didn't feel like I was out of my mind, but I thought, how else can I explain all of this stuff going on? I mean, it was just really endless. And uh, and I ended up meeting, going sort of from one, as I, a lot of people talk about, how all of a sudden a helpful person's put on your path, you know, and that helpful person leads you to another person. So the first helpful person put on my path, ironically, was a Catholic priest. Now, I'd been raised Catholic, but hadn't been inside of a church since I was 17, and so I got lost one day in this little town in Virginia and um, it's sort of in the middle of sort of five o'clock or something in the evening. I was just sort of real, I kind of came to, came to my senses and I looked around and I had no idea where I was, except that there was a bell ringing for, the, for I was outside this little small country church and there was a bell ringing for mass, little Catholic church in this town. And so I went in and I hadn't been to mass I hadn't even been to, I haven't been to mass in, I don't know, how many years since I was in school. And so I, but I just sat there and it was the most beautiful experience. I had somebody singing um, sopranos, that male voice is a lower main voice, of the, the soprano. just beautiful uh, voice singing the Ave Maria. And it was so peaceful. It was like the south with the stained glass windows and the lights coming in. It was like, you know, it was just, you could, just beautiful. And I thought, I'm going to go after the mass. I'm going to go in to interview this priest. I was like going in my journalist hat on. I'm going to go and interview this priest and try to find out, get to the bottom of all of these weird occurrences, you know, find an explanation for them. And uh, I knocked on the rectory door. And as soon as the priest opened the door, he had such a kind face. I just burst into tears. And he sort of had to usher me in and sit me down and get his housekeeper to make me a cup of tea. And, um, you know, and he told me that I told him what was happening and he straight oddly said of all people Catholic priests that um that this was entirely normal that this was very normal as our as my loved one our loved ones do this to let us know they're all right other parishioners had had these experiences so that was just sort of mind-boggling to me because you know the Catholics don't subscribe to this at all you can pray to a saint but not to your dear old dad you know so um, so that sort of led me on a sort of a journey of discovery. And I just happened to be in Virginia where I was, was like the area 51 of the afterlife. I mean, it was like the Monroe Institute was there. The Edgar Casey Center was there. Um, the, uh, there was a spiritualist church in Norfolk right there. You know, so, so I just kind of, I mean, I, was, I just absorbed as much information as I could and um, trying to get to the bottom of what was going on. And um yeah, you know, I went to this Norfolk church, joined a little sat in a circle there and sort of said I was just a journalist doing an interview. I didn't even tell them I was why I was there, you know, and, you know, got a message. And but it took an awful, an awful long time and an awful lot of physical phenomena for the penny to drop for me. I was not a willing convert, I must I must admit. Um, but once the penny dropped, then it all just sort of blew open then everybody's relatives were showing up you know and it was somebody at the at the Edgar Casey Center back in New York was said to me you know you really you really need to do something with this because I wasn't really keen on letting anybody know that this was going on you know and so that's when I popped off to um the Arthur Finley College and started doing proper training because I you know you know I just couldn't just start giving messages with not really sort of bungling along and not knowing what I was doing I really felt given the amount of grief I had come out of and I had on the journey and lots of people had told me horrible things like I mentioned some of them earlier um so it was very very important to me to be very properly trained properly educated to to make sure that I was you know as the Dalai Lama says if you can't help people at least don't hurt them you know so I really went at this with the adage of if I'm going to do this I better do it ethically, conscientiously and well to make sure I don't do anybody any harm. And that sort of that that just went on from there.